Good afternoon, and welcome to the summer series of virtual book talks sponsored by the Harvard Radcliffe Institute. I'm Carol Oja, faculty director of Radcliffe's Humanities Program. Today's event features Megan O'Rourke discussing her book, The Invisible Kingdom, Reimagining Chronic Illness. This event is supported by the Perrin Moorhead Grayson and Bruns Grayson Dean's Leadership Fund for Academic Ventures at Radcliffe. The generosity of donors keeps our programming free and open to the public, and we are grateful. Today's featured guest, Megan O'Rourke, is a New York Times bestselling nonfiction writer and poet. She is editor of the Yale Review and a senior lecturer in English at Yale University. Previously, she served as culture and literary editor for Slate, a founding editor of Double X, a section on Slate that dealt with women's issues, and poetry editor of the Paris Review. She has been a recipient of the Lannan Literary Award, the May Sarton Poetry Prize, and a Guggenheim Fellowship. She's also been a Harvard Radcliffe Fellow. In addition to multiple volumes of poetry, O'Rourke published The Long Goodbye, exploring her mother's death and the complex grief, grief that ensued. Writing in the New York Times Book Review, the critic Gail Caldwell described the book as, a beautifully written chronicle that explores the desolate country that great loss imposes. O'Rourke's The Invisible Kingdom, Reimagining Chronic Illness, delivers another form of memoir. Following O'Rourke's presentation, she will be joined in a discussion with Jonathan Adler, professor of psychology at Olin College of Engineering, visit visiting associate professor at Harvard Medical School, and co-director of the Health Story Collaborative, a nonprofit that aims to elevate the power of storytelling in the medical ecosystem. Harvard Medical School describes Adler as studying the ways in which the process of making sense of negative experiences influences important life outcomes. Finally, a few words about audience participation. During the reading and the discussion, we encourage those watching to use Zoom's Q&A feature to submit your questions. Please do so at any time during the program. The speakers will address as many of the questions as possible in the allotted time. Thanks so much and enjoy this afternoon's conversation. Hello, and thank you so much for coming um, to this virtual talk. It is a tremendous pleasure to be back at the Radcliffe Institute. Um, this book, The Invisible Kingdom, would, would not exist truly without the time I spent in conversation with other minds at Harvard and at the Institute. And of course, just the sheer expanse of time in which I could read and research and think about the many pressing questions that this book takes on. So thank you um, to Rebecca Wasserman and to Radcliffe for having me here. And thank you to Jonathan for speaking with me. <clears throat> so I'm getting over a case of COVID. So if I feel, if I hear it sound a little raspy or cough, please excuse me. Um, I'm going to read just for three or so minutes from The Invisible Kingdom. Um, the Invisible Kingdom tells the story of my own mysterious illness over the course of more than a decade in which I searched for answers and couldn't get a diagnosis. Um, but it's also a work of research in which I try to look at a set of questions um, that would explain some of my, my personal story and connect it to the stories of others. So it aims to both animate the lived experience of illness and then offer kind of cultural context and a cultural history for why it is that so many poorly understood chronic illnesses in particular are really challenging for us to talk about and to treat and diagnose. So I'm going to read from chapter four, which is called Impersonation. And it's a little bit about the crisis of self and of narratives of selfhood that can occur when, when you get sick um, without answers. One of the hardest things about being ill with a poorly understood disease is that most people find what you're going through incomprehensible, if they even believe you are going through it. In your loneliness, your preoccupation with an enduring new reality, you want to be understood in a way that you can't be. Pain is always new to the sufferer, but loses its originality for those around him. The 19th century French novelist Alphonse Daudet observes in his book, In the Land of Pain. Everyone will get used to it except me. Worrying that your symptoms are psychosomatic or even imagined 
is part of life for many people with poorly understood illnesses. Although the experience of illness is not just in the head, it is also not just in the body. The person enduring such an illness faces a difficult balancing act. On the one hand, she must advocate for herself, even when doctors are indifferent or ignorant, and not be deterred when she knows something is wrong. On the other, she also must be willing to ask whether an obsessive attention to symptoms is going to lead to better health. The patient has to hold in mind two contradictory modes, in other words, insistence on the reality of the disease and resistance to her own most catastrophic fears. I found it hard in the fall and winter of 2012 to strike that balance. I was increasingly worried. After all, a terrible anxiety attends chronic illness. Over time, it becomes difficult to untangle the suffering from symptoms like pain from the suffering inflicted by the anxiety over the possibility of more pain and worse outcomes in the future. This does not mean that the illness is in the mind. Rather, the mind, that machine for making meaning, makes endless meanings of its new state, which may themselves influence the experience. It was in this recursive hall of mirrors trying to adjust to my body's ailments that I lived. There is a loneliness to illness, a child's desire to be pitied and seen, but, is, but it is precisely this recognition that is elusive. How can you explain and identify your condition if no one has any grasp of what it is you suffer from and the symptoms wax and wane? How do you describe a disease that's not always there? The hardest thing to convey to doctors or friends was the debilitating fatigue, which many other patients I knew experienced as well. Complaining of fatigue sounds like moral weakness. In New York City, tired is normal. But the fatigue of physical dysfunction I came to recognize is as different from normal sleep deprivation as COVID-19 is from the common cold. It was not caused by needing sleep, I thought, but by my body's cellular conviction that it needed to conserve energy in order to fix whatever was wrong. The feeling erased my will, the sense of identity that drives most of us. The worst part of my fatigue was the loss of an intact self, sense of self. It wasn't just that I suffered brain fog. It wasn't just the loss of self that sociologists talk about in connection with chronic illness, in which everything you know about yourself disappears and you have to build a different life. Rather, as I got sicker that winter, I no longer had the sense that I was a distinct person. On most days, I felt like a mechanism that moved arduously through the world, simply trying to complete its tasks. Sitting upright at my father's birthday dinner at a quiet restaurant required a huge act of will. Normally, absorption in a task, an immersive flow, can lead you to forget that you feel pain, but my fatigue made such a state impossible. I might, at the nadir of my illness, have been able to write any one of these sentences, but I would not have been able to make paragraphs of them. To be sick in this way is to have, to have the unpleasant feeling that you are impersonating yourself. When you're sick, the act of living is more act than living. Healthy people have the luxury of forgetting that their existence depends on a cascade of precise cellular interactions, not you. Farewell me, cherished me, now so hazy, so indistinct, Dow Day writes, a line I now often thought of. I'm gonna stop there and invite Jonathan to uh, join me on the virtual floor, Jonathan. Hi, thank you for that little taste of your spectacular book, Megan. Um, before we launch in on, again, on both of our behalves, I just want to thank Becky Wasserman and the team at Harvard Radcliffe Institute for inviting us to join you today uh, and to Professor Oja for that kind introduction. Um, I also want to let everyone joining us know that we would love to take your questions. Um, so Megan and I are going to chat for a little while, but then we're going to transition into taking your questions. So at any time during the program, please feel free to submit your questions. Uh, use the Q and A function at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Um, that can, and if you can keep your questions as concise as possible, that would be great because it'll make it easier for us to elevate your ideas, but also stay present with each other during the conversation. Okay, so let me start by first just saying how much I've been looking forward to this conversation. I've been a fan of your writing for many years, Megan, and I was eagerly anticipating your book. Um, as someone on my own much more minor, mysterious chronic illness quest, I found it deeply affirming. Um, and as a scholar of personal narrative and as someone who works closely with 
with this nonprofit uh, health story collaborative here in Cambridge, I found it deeply important. So I wanted to kick things off on this note of gratitude. Thank you. It's I'm as I said to you yesterday. I'm just, I'm so looking forward to talking with you and so admire your work. So well, I've got all the pleasantries and the exactly. <laughs> well, so I want to open with actually the most important, but maybe also the hardest question to answer neatly, which is just how are you today? You know, it's funny. If you had asked me six weeks ago, I would have said I was doing really good. I, I was probably the best I had been in years. Um, feeling pretty energetic, writing, exercising, and then I got COVID. And I will say that that really knocked me sideways. And I, all the questions in this book, let's say, just have risen up again for me, right? For sure. Um, in interesting ways. And I, it, though I've already written about long COVID and been thinking a lot about long COVID and writing another article about it, it, it did give me a kind of fresh insight into what it's like to worry about, you know, having a condition that we really truly understand so little about and also that access is so pressured now because there's so, so many people living with chronic illnesses. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm sorry that we find you in this moment. It's great to be with you even in this moment. So but even in the past two days, I'm myself, almost myself again. So yes. All Can right. You well, maybe yeah. that's the note that we should start on almost <laughs> myself again. So almost um, myself. When you and I chatted before, we talked, so I'm someone who has this outlook as someone who studies the role of personal narrative in constituting our sense of self and supporting our well-being. So I'm going to frame our discussion through that lens. And as I mentioned to you, I'm, I'm currently working on this project on what I'm calling identity theft, where people sort of lose narrative authority over their lives. And it seems to me that your experience and certainly the excerpt that you kicked us off with could be understood as one of identity theft. Um, you write about the erasure that comes with your illness, but also this lingering sense that you are still somewhere to be found. So I wanted to kick us off by hearing a little bit more about the way you now, from your vantage point of today, look back on the chapter of your life recounted in the book, but also the chapter writing the book, and think about this character of you as both the protagonist, but also as the narrator writing the book. Yeah, it's such a great question. And I, I'm really excited for your, your work on identity theft, which I think is the perfect term for that loss of self that I'm trying to describe. Um, and, and that term loss of self is a term that I think Kathy Charnaz uses to talk about how disease forces you to build a new life and a new self. But in my case, I felt that that identity shift and self shift went deeper and wider than just, okay, I can't, you know, run anymore. I can't work. It, it had to do with the ways in which the conditions I suffered with waxed and waned, um, were unpredictable, roamed the body, right? So it wasn't though I could say, okay, I've got a lung problem. I've got a heart problem. It was just this constellation of symptoms that were I to share with the doctor, I could quickly see them starting to become suspicious <laughs> because it, there were just so many of them. Um, but also because it took so long for me to get a diagnosis. And again, many of my symptoms were invisible. We call a lot of these diseases invisible illnesses because you can look very healthy. And because a lot of them have to do with energy limitations, you, you can kind of get out there and perform for the world in limited bursts only to really suffer a setback privately in your home. Um, and so all of that meant that as a person living with illness, I didn't even know I was living with illness for a long time. And that led to this series of questions about, is there something wrong with me? Not just a physical illness, but something wrong with me. Like I'm, everyone feels this kind of pain and fatigue and I'm just hypersensitive. You know, I'm just like not hacking it, right? So. There's all of that. So I think when I look back, and I'll, I'll stop talking in a second, but you've unleashed the, <laughs> you know, I've written a whole book trying to answer this question. Um, but when I look back, I, you know, this sounds super hokey, but it's really true. I just, it's very painful to look back at that self then because I just think, my God, you know, you should have trusted yourself. And I think a lot of the reason I wrote this book is to both give it, you know, animate the experience to help people trust themselves and also to give 
language to the experience in a way that caregivers, healthcare workers, family, colleagues can, can read it and see, okay, this is, this is, there's a shape to this. I don't know. There's more I could say, but hopefully. No, that's great. I want to, I want to sort of refract what you just said through a couple of different lenses, but I think, I think we should start by thinking about coherence, right? So you so beautifully found a way to narrate the fundamental incoherence of, <laughs> of the illness experience and especially your illness experience, right? So you quote Elaine Scarry's you know, timeless notion that physical pain doesn't simply resist language, but actively destroys it. And yet you became this native speaker of illness. So you find the words, but the narrative through line keeps slipping as your explanatory frameworks evolve and clearly continue to evolve up to this day. Um, as a quick aside, I, I wrote a play that's running off Broadway right now that juxtaposes AIDS and COVID. And oh, wow. my collaborator and I found something similar in trying to write about COVID where we felt we, we could resurrect and revise sort of dominant na AIDS narratives from the 80s. But the COVID narrative kept evolving as we were writing in a way that was hard to pin down. So I loved the way you wrote about your illness as moving in spiral time, whereas you were sort of necessarily living in linear time. Yes. So I would love to hear your reflections now about the act of writing this book when it comes to lending your narrative, your personal narrative coherence, and then also about the ways in which this book now exists as a static thing, but your life and your illness continue on. So how do you think about, about the role of coherence in chronic illness, in your chronic illness, and especially as your story continues to evolve? Yeah, you, you've nailed what was, or you've gotten to the heart of what was one of the most challenging parts as a writer. You know, I, I was a writer before I was a person with an illness. <laughs> um, and so I think of this book as very much being about a biographical problem that also became a kind of literary or communicative problem, right? And that what drove me to write it was that problem of communication, that problem of making a shape out of this incoherent experience and this kind of spiraling experience. Um, you know, the book took almost a decade to write. So, one of the reasons for that was that the illness changed as I was writing, right? And so when I began the book, I thought it was primarily about autoimmune disease. My very first diagnosis was of an autoimmune disease. It's a bit murky. I had thyroiditis, but I also had some thing like lupus. But as I started writing, it became clear I also had tick-borne illness. I also had POTS. I had a genetic condition known as Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. So speaking of slipperiness, it was like the 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 answer kept changing, right? So what very quickly, and then the other part of it was that a commitment of mine was to that incoherence, right? I very much did not want to write a book um, that was an illness narrative with a very tidy resolution of, I got better, here's what I learned from it, you too can do it, <laughs> even though I want to give my readers hope and something to hold on to. But it seemed to me it would be false. It would be false news to say, you know, I started here and I've suffered and I ended up here um, because chronic illness resists conclusion. It comes and goes, it crops back up just when you least expect it. But as a writer, you need some structure, you need some coherence. So I realized that the structure of the book was the structure of a kind of thwarted quest, right? Not a quest in which all is found, but a quest in which you realize the very nature of the quest was wrong from the beginning. And that was that I wanted to get better. And in fact, what I had to learn was how not to get better, but how to live around that. And part of the answer was that it didn't have anything to do with me. It had to do with our society and the changes our society had to make. And all too often in our country, we put it on ourselves. How do I change? How do I fix this? What do I do, right? But actually, yes, let's hold on to what we can control, but also let's call for radical social change and reimagining chronic illness. Yeah. Absolutely. It's amazing. We're, we're so on the same wavelength about how these things connect. My next question was going to be to step beyond your own personal narrative and think about the sort of broader culture na cultural narratives. So in the introduction, you write, um, our bodies may feel autonomous, but we all live in the nexus of radical interconnection. Yeah. And 
there's this gorgeous proliferation of words that orbit around this idea that the American individualistic self is not only a fiction, but a detrimental one. Um, so you use words like porousness and interconnectedness and intertwined. And then you also introduce us to this fantastic scientific jargon um, that also speaks to this. So uh, words like H. pylori's commensal relationship with our bodies, or um, Amy Prohl's notion of humans as a super organism or a holobiont. Um, and even the metaphoric value in the diagnostic term dysautonomia. Right. Um, and, then, and then finally, you've got this piercing notion of the body as a site of social encounter, not as a vessel for American hyper-individualism. So I think we all have some understanding of the historical lineage of this way of thinking about the self. But I actually would love to hear some more about how this realization and sort of mapping it to your own experience actually influences the way you live in the world. What does it mean to live in this hyper-individualistic society as someone with a real under lived visceral understanding of the limitations of that way of construing the self? Yeah. I mean, it was radicalizing, right? It, it you know, I don't always live up to the radicalization, but I, I found it to be a radicalizing experience and in part because I was that person, that hyper-individualistic, you know, trying to succeed, always wanting to be the A student, um, you know, thinking what's the next rung on the left. I mean, not quite, but there's that way in which we all live, or not all of us, but many of us live, live like that. Um, and I think also part of that was that it was very hard for me to understand other people's sicknesses that weren't super clear cut. So a very dear friend of mine in high school's mother had what we called then chronic fatigue syndrome, what people now call myalgic encephalomyelitis slash chronic fatigue syndrome sometimes. And I just really didn't understand it. I thought clearly there's something psychological going on. She's depressed, right? So when I say radicalization, part of that radicalization was not just the shift from thinking about my life and how I fix my own problems to thinking about how social policy, food deserts, racism, sexism, all that shapes my life and others, but also to kind of accepting other people's testimony in a really different way from the way I used to, so that I have a much more, I'm much more open to just hearing what people have to say, I think, um, than I used to be. In terms of my work and the radicalization, you know, I think it's why I wrote this book, right? It's it's why I'm writing and reporting a lot on long COVID. And that I think is a key priority for me over the next year or two. There's other books I'm trying to write and want to write, but I just feel we're living through not just the pandemic, but a pandemic of chronic illness that is a kind of shadow pandemic that is just starting to come into focus. So yeah, it has shifted the way I think about my priorities and the way that I think about um, caring for and listening to to others that's not too yeah good. yeah and I think you're so right that 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 shadow pandemic or the echo pandemic um is one that the medical system is not as well positioned to handle as one where individual people get individual discrete diagnoses and we can you know either treat them or fail to treat them but so right. yeah, I wanted, you write about chronic illness as sort of the signature diagnosis of our time, um, and autoimmune illness in particular as the signature diagnosis of our time. I'm curious about, um, I'm, I'm curious about how that notion intersects with this idea of hyper-individualism. So the, right, so, I guess I'll leave it there. What are your thoughts on that intersection? I'm so glad you just connected that because that's the other part of the answer to your question. So there's a chapter in the book called Autoimmunity as Metaphor, which harkens back to Susan Sontag's brilliant, famous book, Illness as Metaphor, in which she looks at and makes the argument that, an argument I take up in this book, that illnesses we don't understand, we almost relentlessly psychologize and stigmatize. And what does that mean, psychologize? Well, when she critiques using metaphor, when we talk about illness, she's not saying, as often gets misunderstood, 
that patients shouldn't describe their pain metaphorically. That's not at all the metaphor she means. She means the cultural metaphors that we create around illness states. So she was talking specifically about how breast cancer and certain forms of cancer were at a, at a point in American history thought of as diseases of repressed emotions, especially when women have them. Um, not an idea we really have them. Little pockets here and there in the kind of wellness community, it pops up. But it's not in the kind of common cultural parlance, but it, what I found when I was diagnosed with an autoimmune disease and, and went as one does online, if you're a 21st century patient, what I found is that there were these heartbreaking patient groups where people were suffering and overwhelmingly women, but some men too, were posting about their experience of autoimmune disease as a kind of encounter with having to reckon with their selfhood and their life choices. So the word auto and autoimmune disease is the word self, right? So autoimmune disease, the, the immune system turns on itself as, as immunologists say, they actually use the language of selfhood in, in, in the scientific jargon. Um, and so I trace in that chapter, the fact that that language is sort of accidental, right? We, we could say that in autoimmune disease, the immune system turns on the body's tissues and fails to distinguish, you know, um, you know, safe tissue from non-safe tissue. But instead, we talk about this idea of selfhood. So we've inherited this metaphor that the immune system in an autoimmune disease is turning on itself. And what happens is that people living with autoimmune diseases were seeing that okay, my immune system is attacking myself. Something must be inauthentic in my life, right? And what I would say in the book is that in our secular and individualistic nation, rather than think about the steep rise in autoimmune disease as a consequence of the rise in chemicals, um, changes in the food, in the industrialized food system, um, chronic stressors such as poverty, racism, lack of a social safety net, instead of those things that we know from science cause, contribute to, or we suspect strongly, I should say, contribute to the rise of autoimmune disease, People were instead saying, I need to uncover the authentic nature of myself and fix this by making myself a different dinner from everyone else in the house, right? So, so that's kind of what I mean, whereas you sort of trace the evolution of these metaphors and you see how, you know, we, we have a disease that is a scientific reality. We have an illness that is a story we tell about that reality. Yeah, absolutely. And then it's interesting because at least in our cultural context, we continue to construe ourselves as these independent individuals. And so that story is our story, even if it's part of this. So I guess I'm curious, again, hearkening back to one of my earlier questions, how does it actually impact the way you move through the world to have a, an, an expansive understanding of your role in the broader cultural context? I mean, that's an absurd question from sort of an Eastern context where the, the construal of self is different, but in an American context, it is almost a little foreign uh, to think about ourselves, not as the center of the story, not as the protagonist, not as the independent person. So has it shifted the way you navigate your daily life? I think that it's made me feel less bad for myself, <laughs> right? I, I think that, for example, getting COVID and I had quite a lot of symptoms after the infection resolved and it was terrifying, right? And I was like, I have to fix this right now. And there was actually something quite bracing and humbling about thinking about what I knew from my work and thinking about the fact that in fact, I was one of millions and that actually the real problem is not my crisis, but the ways in which we need to make sure the NIH is funding the right research with its $1.3 billion and, you know, getting, getting access to people really in need, um, you know, whether in rural communities, um, first generation, people of color who don't have that access. So, yeah, I feel like it, it's a weird, for me, it's comforting. For me, there is a comfort, um, you know, I remember after my mother died, my father and I were spending time together at his house in Connecticut and the Perseid meteor showers were happening, are happening right around now, I think too. And we had this great conversation where he said, you know, I love looking up at the stars at night because it just makes me think that my suffering and my sorrow and my grief are such a tiny part of this larger mystery, you know? So instead of being made lonely by the smallness, he was, he was found consolation. And I, I would say something similar. 
The other part is just that I do feel this um, responsibility as a kind of, you know, I don't know, as a public intellectual, but as a person with public facing writing to really keep trying to get these ideas out there because I think that once you have frameworks for understanding these in what we call infection associated conditions or these energy limiting diseases, once those frameworks are widely out there, it, it's no longer the job of the individual to explain to their employer, I have this energy limiting condition. When I exert myself, I crash. I can only do so much, right? That, then it's just known the way that we know chemotherapy is debilitating and the pain and fatigue come and go, right? So we, we need these frameworks out there and that's gonna help the, the individual. Absolutely, yeah. In my scholarly world, we talk about sort of cultural master narratives. Um, and indeed, the only way to shift them is to put out individual narratives that in some way repudiate the cultural master narrative. So yeah, writing this book is definitely a public health intervention. It gets alternative narratives out there into the cultural discourse in a way that people can talk to NIH or their individual physicians or their employers right. or their partners in different ways. Right. right. Um, yeah. Just pausing to remind everyone who's joining us that I see your questions pouring in. Please keep them in. I'm trying to sort of curate them on the side so that we'll get to them in just a little bit. Um, but it's please keep them coming. Um, so I wanted to loop back on one other theme that's running through the book. So I think this American hyper individualism aligns with another cultural narrative that's so powerful in your writing, which is this expectation for redemption from life's challenges. So again, I can tell you that scholars in my field have been studying this theme of redemption for decades. Um, my graduate mentor, Dan McAdams, published a book back in 2006 called The Redemptive Self Stories Americans Live By. Um, and there's a strong social science literature to support the notion that redemption is positively associated with psychological well-being. Um, and work uh, by my colleague Kate McLean and others suggest that American listeners also prefer redemptive stories to other kinds of thematic arts. And yet, um, certainly in my work with Health Story Collaborative, I've heard many medical patients who have similar experiences to yours, Megan, where they're expected to tell redemptive stories about their illnesses, right? So you write, if you must be ill, at least be improved by your illness. So when redemption doesn't feel like a viable option, how should people approach narrating the unredeemable? I think that the fundamental important point I want to make is shifting it from, again, the individual finding redemption to us collectively asking, what are the conditions that make redemptive narratives possible? And what are the conditions that make it impossible for the person living with illness to get to that place of psychological well-being? And how are we blocking that and what can we do to change it? So again, you know, what I, one thing I say in the book, I can't remember the exact line, but I say something like, you know, there's also this idea of accepting your illness, right? This is going back to the Kathy Charnas and loss of self, right? You do at some point have to, and I talk about this, it's like, I think you do at some point have to accept and build a new life, right? But the refrain I heard from the dozens, I interviewed almost a hundred patients and that resonated with me and that I myself had said was, you can't build that new life. You can't accept the reality of your illness. You can't find that psychological well-being when no one recognizes the reality of that new condition that you're trying to integrate into a social self. We're social creatures. Illness is not happening to us as autonomous, isolated individuals, you know, in a hospital bed pod that no one enters, right? It's absolutely a social experience in which it changes our jobs, it changes our family relationships, it changes our possibility for love to have children, right? Many long COVID patients young, are young women who are saying, I don't now think I can have a family. So we have to ask ourselves, what do we need to do in order to allow for that, that redemption to come in? And redemption, you know, I think in the end can be a very pluralistic term. It doesn't have to be, I'm better. It can be, you know, I've taken my suffering and I've turned it into, um, you know, being useful to others. But not everyone is gonna get there, even when we create the conditions for more people to get there. It's just, I think these, these you know, invisible illnesses are just 
so challenging because they they're punitive. They 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 punish you for effort, right? So often you make an effort and you get set back. They they're unpredictable. Like there's just it's so hard to adjust to that reality. I think that's one reason that we look away from that. Yeah. So I think, I think you're that, right. I think too, you know, in in the psychological psychological literature on well-being, we sort of think about this two dimension. These two dimensions. One is feeling good. The this Aristotelian hedonic well-being and the alternative is eudaimonia right or eudaimonia so like things feel meaningful and but even me so your illness experience and many people's experience resists hedonia like it doesn't feel good it's not gonna feel good um, or it's gonna feel good and then not feel good and then feel good and not feel good again um, so it's not a linear narrative but there's a way in which the nature of the condition itself actually presents an impediment, impediment to meaning making as well, not just because it's so incoherent, temporally incoherent yeah. and causally incoherent for many people too, but also because meaning takes work. And yeah. if you're so yeah. fatigued all the time, so so then it really is this, what are you left with? And if you can't feel good, can't feel sort of good in the happiness sense, but you also, but you don't have the bandwidth for meaning. Um, what do those days look like? And how do you sort of seize on the days when you do have a little more bandwidth? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and I, I think, again, you know, it's hard to find meaning when your disease is being dismissed. Or the other thing that happens, by the way, is that people believe in you, but they, they want to reassure you. And the other piece we haven't talked about is just that our general discomfort with discomfort, <laughs> right? And so I had many friends who were very supportive and well-meaning, but they always wanted to say, well, look at what you've learned from your illness or look at what you've gained. And I wanted to not look at, I wanted to I just have my suffering recognized for a second. That may sound very self-pitying, but it it was real. You know, if I'm going to be honest, I wrote the book to be honest. There was just a way in which I was like, no, let's just acknowledge what's lost before we before you move on. So I, uh, just to interrupt for a second, I think that's one of the most important messages in the whole book actually is to say, wait a minute, before we look for something to come out of this, let's just pause and acknowledge how much this sucks yes. um, and really, really name that before yeah. trying to move on and make something out of it. Sorry, go on. Yeah, no, I think that's it. I think, you know, because when you give the person room if, if you witness the suffering, if you say, yes, this sucks, I see your pain, I see that you're wincing, you then make space for the person to say, yes, and you know, I'm so glad to be having a coffee here with you, or yes, and, right? And so it, it's funny, someone asked me the other day, I can't remember exactly what they asked me, but it was something about how I deal with unpredictability now. And I mean, it's totally different because I have a sense of what's going on and because I've written this book and I've actually succeeded in a way in telling the story. I realized that since the book came out, I've actually felt better than I've felt about this piece of it. And I think it's, it's there in the speaks to your work, John, and there's such a power in just putting it down and feeling that it can be seen in its mess. Um, so I think that allowing that mess is actually con in a contradictory way, the way toward finding you know. I completely agree. I'm curious if you have actual tips for folks who are in similar situations for how to approach that task of just putting down the words, putting down the meaning. I think it's worth really trying to write even an email to family members and friends. And you may think that it would not be welcome, right? But it's funny. I remember after I published the, the this book began with an article in the New Yorker about what I thought was then just an autoimmune disease. And after I read it, my father and my brother, who were you know wonderful and supportive parts of my life, both separately called me and said, wow, I had no idea you were going through this. Now I had said it to them many times, but there was something about reading it in a shape that, you know, what I love about writing, the reason I'm a writer of all the art forms, well, first of all, I would be a terrible visual artist, but, what I love about it is that it's the only art form that allows us, or it's the art form that most intimately allows us to shadow another consciousness, right, through language, through thought. So I think that there's a way in which you might be surprised by just the act of writing something down with the idea of sharing 
doing it. Um, and one thing I've done at various points when I was the most sick was just had a couple friends to whom I would write an email and just say, this is what's going on. I'm finding it un pretty much unbearable. And just the act of doing that and getting just back the simple, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry, but I wish we could help you, enabled me to keep going. So I think it can be a very small ask of yourself. Um, and I think- I think we right. forget how often we, we are the narrator of our lives, not just the main character. And that right. self-authorship doesn't have to mean writing a New York Times best-selling book, <laughs> that an email is actually an act of self-authorship. -auth self self -authorship. And if self-authorship is what's slipping away, then actually that's a powerful act. Right. And it's a claim on others' attention that I actually think is more likely to be met than, than, other, than claims in the moment for, for whatever reason. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's right. So, okay. We have... Sorry, we have a torrent of questions coming in, which is wonderful, and people should keep going, but I want to make sure to switch and start to elevate some of them. So the first one is one that was on my list too, so that's why I picked it, but a bunch of people have been asking you to think about the ways in which your experience as a woman you cast sort of a unique lens on your experience, and I would just add um, about thinking about whiteness as a lens too. You've already spoken about both pieces, but I'd like to sort of elevate that and, and have you talk a little bit about the gendered and racialized ways in which your experience unfolded and what you've heard from people who have different lived experiences and um, what insights that provides. Yeah. So one of the chapters in the book is called The Woman Problem, and it really tries to answer this question that I have, as an, I think many of us have as an intuition, which is, Hey, it feels like something about the fact that I'm a, you know, in my case, quite a, I was quite young when I got sick in my early 20s. You know, it feels like something about the fact that I'm a young woman is leading, is contributing to this problem of recognition and validation. That I, I was looking for recognition and validation from healthcare professionals. And in fact, all too often, what I was met with was, you know, I mean, one doctor I said, your cholesterol levels are great, you know, and you're thin, like you're fine as if those were the only two markers of health, right? Um, and often, you know, I had a very intense job. I was working at the New Yorker magazine as an editor. They'd say, well, you're very stressed. Are you sleeping well? No, of course I wasn't. So, you know, it's that. And, you know, I took that at face value. So anyway, I try to really report on and dig into this question of, is gender a piece of this? And, you know, the, sh the short answer is yes, of course, as we all, as we all suspect. And it's, it's there in two ways. The first, which is not small, is that there is a knowledge gap, right? We have actually studied women's bodies much less than we've studied, studied um, male bodies. And so, you know, that means that drugs aren't tested on women separately. In many clinical trials, things are looked at predominantly men sometimes, or in the past, you know, and the animal studies were almost exclusively biologically male animals. So things happened like um, Ambien was put on the market and all these women were getting into like car accidents the next day, tra some tragic, tragic cases. And then they looked at it again and they realized that, hey, the dosage for women needs to be completely different from the dosage of half the dose, I think, for men because we metabolize them simply. So, you know, if you step into the doctor's office with something like endometriosis or certain kinds of, you know, um, diseases, there's just going to be this knowledge gap that means it's more likely that you're going to get dismissed. Then too, as I try to talk about, there's, I think, this legacy of the epidemic of the diagnosis of hysteria in the 19th century and the way that that comes into Freudianism and psychology and the ways in which we start to read the body that has inexplicable or medically unexplained symptoms as the site of a sort of hidden psychological story, a trauma, you know, sexual abuse, whatever it might be. So um, what Freud does in short is, you know, comes along and makes it into the fact that if we can't figure out what's wrong with you in some sense, then the problem is you, right? There's something in you that, and, and you know, we don't have to be Freudians for that idea to still actually be one of these cultural narratives, these master narratives that you're talking about. I think it's there in every doctor's office. Um, Lisa Sanders, who writes the diagnosis columns for the New York Times says, she always says, well, medically unexplained to whom, right? I, I think that's the question, right? Is it medically unexplained generally or is it medically unexplained to you? Because, um, and then in terms of things like race and you know, also just different kinds of lack of access, I mean, 
you know, I talk in the book a fair amount about Arlene Geronimus's idea of weathering um, and her work finding that, you know, looking at the question of why so many younger black women were dying after birth, right? And some of it has to do with treatment and some of it seems to have to do with actually ways in which the stressors of racism actually shape your immune system, your health, right? And so that obviously is a huge issue in the COVID-19 pandemic when we were seeing more rates of death in the case of black and brown people than in white people. And there was a lot of, you know, debate, political debate, politicized around, you know, well, maybe their lifestyle choices aren't as good. And it's like, well, no, I mean, we, we have this really good research that shows us that racism itself is a disease, you know, it's a disease that we inflict on, on people of color. So that's a really big, obviously I'm white. And so as I was writing the book, I was like, I don't, I can't pretend that I'm not white, but what I can say is that part of my responsibility as an individual writing my story is to say, this story is shaped by my whiteness in privileged ways. So as bad as this is, there's these ways in which there are things I am not, you know, enduring. Um, yeah. Yeah, thanks. So another interesting question is about how to think about taking patient narratives and actually centering them in the medical encounter. So either in the medical record or uh, in the medical system more broadly writ. We all have the experience of being fragmented by the medical, or many of us do, I certainly do. So a narrative is fundamentally integrative. So how, what are your thoughts about how to center patient narrative or at least amplify patient narrative in the current, current medical systems that we've got? Yeah, it's such a big question. I've been thinking a lot about it. I, I think the first thing we have to do, which is maybe a pipe dream, but we have to build time into the medical encounter for the patient to tell their narrative. I mean, you know, I think there's a statistic in the book that doctors on average interrupt patients after something like 90 seconds of speech. If you think of most appointments are about 15 minutes long, some, some studies say even shorter, some say longer, it can vary, certainly a first appointment is longer, but you have this very compressed time and the doctor or the healthcare worker is under time pressure. So I, I do think that the times when I've been able to tell my story for, which might take 10 minutes, it has really created this relationship that I have not been able to establish in other cases. So I, I do think the number one thing is actually just seeing the narrative as an important piece of the healthcare encounter that actually is a healing piece, right? Um, the other, I think, is to really use that narrative to create space for a conversation around what's bothering the person most, right? Often when I told my story, doctors went to a certain symptom, often joint pain that I had mentioned, and skipped right over actually three things that were much more troublesome to me and much more, you know, getting in the way of my life. And something I like from palliative care is that in palliative care, which I think is a kind of model for chronic illness care, you know, the patient is ideally asked, you know, how do you want to spend this time? We know you're terminally ill, but what matters to you? What value? What's getting most in the way of your life and your well-being? And I think we need that, that model in chronic illness care. And it starts with the, the patient narrative. Um, I don't know. I mean, it would be amazing if there were, you know, ways even outside of the, the individual doctor appointment to kind of build storytelling into hospital systems and into, you know, like patients, you know, story afternoon. I don't know, right? Everyone's so pressed for time, but you could see a really imaginative in intervention. And again, you know, if you think about, we didn't used to have palliative care and now that's a routine part of the healthcare system. So I think there's room for a similar kind of innovation around chronic illness. I, yeah, I completely agree. And indeed, uh, Annie Brewster, who founded Health Story Collaborative, that was exactly the impulse was to insert patient narrative in. And, and indeed we do. And it's it's incredibly healing. We do some you know events that just focus on patient stories, but some where we pair patient and provider stories. And those are incredibly healing for providers too, who feel equally pressured by the system, equally unsatisfied um, equally set up in sometimes an adversarial relationship instead of a healing relationship. Absolutely. So I, and, and, you know, this book is critical of the medical system as a way of actually being, I think, I think of it at least as being quite sympathetic to doctors who are in an impossible situation and we are serving no one in this current setup. Um, the way we've structured it makes it really challenging for healthcare to be, 
provide the kind of ethic of care that I think so many people got into it for. And that's like, yes, exactly. So then I'm curious, picking up on that, we've talked a little bit about metaphor of autoimmune disease. I wonder if we also might think a little bit about the metaphor of the of doctoring or you know taking care of patients. A detective story sets up a particular kind of interaction where it's, we got to find the answer and then you find the answer and it's done. And somehow diagnosis is denouement, but for patient, it's often the beginning of the story. Right. Oh, now I'm someone with X. I need to figure out how to live my life like that. I'm curious if you can think about alternative metaphors for doctoring that might lead to more productive medical encounters for everyone. Yeah. I think of it a little bit like the coach, right? I mean, I think I, as a chronic, I often said to my my husband, I really, it's like I need a, I would say I need a detective at first, and then I would say I need a coach, right? And you're absolutely right that diagnosis is not denouement; it's in a sense a new beginning. And I'm careful in the book to say, as much as I craved a diagnosis, it was not the end. It was the, it was the beginning, right? And so what I think you're looking for as a person with chronic illness is that coach or that it's like a therapist even, right? Where sometimes what you want, again, is just to be seen and validated. You know, you know what you need to do. If you're having a flare, you need to recommit to your sleep and your diet and blah, 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 whatever your things are. But it's hard to do it by yourself. It takes willpower. You know, maybe you're got a sick parent or a fussy child and you, you know, you, you can't always put yourself first. And so it can be really helpful to have that doctoring that is a kind of whatever it is you need. Maybe some people need, you know, tough love. Some people need empathetic listening and just finding that relationship and building it out. I have a great rheumatologist who basically that's what she, she does. You know, she listens, she helps, she helps me figure out things. Um, yeah. That's wonderful. Um, so without a doubt, the most dominant thread in the question, the many questions that we've received is, um, is one of gratitude, one of feeling seen, one of feeling affirmed. So, you know, someone said what you just said in the first five minutes gave words to something that I've been trying to name for the last 15 years. Um, and then everyone wants to know, what can we do? What can we do? I want to do something. And I think there's a thread of questions, especially around what can caretakers do? Caretakers, not the medical caretakers, which I think you've already offered a, a really nice frame for, but what can family members, loved ones, friends, what can they do? How can they relate in a, in a better way to loved ones in their lives with these kinds of chronic illnesses? It's such a big and important question, and we could talk about this for an entire hour. So anything I say is going to be necessarily too reductive or too limited or too simple, but it's, I'm so glad we're asking that question. I'm so glad we're thinking about it. I, I do think, and I know this sounds really obvious, but just going back to that first principle of recognition and validation, you know, I, I quote um, Alphonse Daudet, the French novelist. There's another, if I quote a lot, he says in the book about his pain, you know, he has this moment where he realizes that everyone else will get used to his pain, but he never will. He will never get used to it. And I do think that the nature of a chronic illness is that there is this way in which, even though you accept it and learn to live with it, there are days where it just floors you and takes you totally by surprise, where the grief hits in a, in a new way. So I do think being there for the process, right, um, mirroring, listening to where the, the person is. I think about this a lot because my son, my older son has some issues and he's very young. So there's a lot he can't understand yet. So I think if you're a parent, a lot of it is figuring out where, where do you meet the child? And some of it's listening to their questions. Some of it's giving them a framework that they can understand. We both have Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, which is pretty intense. So I have to say very basic things like, you know, you're your ankles are more wobbly than other people's. And some that means your body's working really hard and sometimes you're more tired than your friends. Like keep it very simple, but just mirror. And when he asks questions being present and try to normalize it for, for him. So, but also never normalize it, but not um, erase it, <laughs> right? Um, normalize it in the sense that I say, we all have things we're struggling with, but you really do have this thing. So I, I think there's so much, I practically going to doctor's appointments is really helpful. Even if someone says no, it's just 
I can never remember what a doctor said to me, even if I take notes. It's like there's a way in which when it's you, you just get stressed and your cortisol rises. So having that calm presence, who can also ask questions in a and also testify to the validity of what you're saying. I think that's very, very important. Yeah, I'm curious about, you You touch on your experience as a parent in the book, though the the, the period of your life in yeah. the book is more from before, but I'm really curious how you think about, um, I imagine it was terrifying to you to first to ask the question, do either of my kids have this yeah. syndrome and what does it mean for them if they do and what's my role in helping yeah. them understand that. How do you navigate your own, there's a dual consciousness there I find a lot as another parent of young children where yeah. you're having your own experience of their experience yeah. and trying to be there for their experience but not forgetting your own experience. Yeah. So how do you navigate that, that dual role especially when it comes to health and your kids? Yeah. yeah. I have to write a lot down. I have to journal about it, to be honest, because I it speaks to your work too, John. It's like, I have to, because I get really fearful for him and anxious at times. And then at other times I get really busy and I think, oh my God, I'm not paying enough attention to this, right? So I find it very helpful to just stop and kind of put to put down and make form of what my experience is so that then I, I can be there for him. And you know, a lot of it is actually being patient. He's not ready to take in very much, he's five, so he's quite young. So there's a lot I know and I'm watching and I'm anxious about and I have to kind of pull back. And I also not, have to not ascribe everything. You know, there's so much of parenting that's about not, we have two kids, not making one the this kid and this the other kid, right? There's so many ways in which we, we tend to re reductively label. So there's that too, he has this, but we don't know yet what it means for him, right? Yeah. It doesn't oh yeah, I think that's so much. A part of parenting more than one kid is is whether reducing them to the, the to their gender or you know some other characteristic. Um, all right, we need to move to our last question. Time flies, um, yeah. and I think I want to end on a forward-looking note, which is really about how you think about how how having written this book and spoken about this book so much. Um, has shifted your outlook going forward and what feels most important to you net in the next chapter of your life? Yeah. I mean, I think it's it's funny. I I'm, have a book project that's very different. And I was thinking, you know, it's as hard as this book was to write, I did have this clear sense that maybe if, if what I was trying to do worked, it would be helpful to people. And that's not always the case as a writer that you have that kind of project. And so I do think, especially in the scope of the light of the pandemic, I feel this very real sense of, okay, I've assembled this knowledge base, wanting to continue to write about some of these issues in particular, taking on workplace issues, like how do we deal with this crisis of chronic illness and the workplace as we look at long COVID and how that makes us look deeply at autoimmune disease and other things. Um, again, long COVID and narratives around long COVID. So yeah, it's it's made me feel like, there's other things pulling at me, but I can't let the, the subject go. And there's so much more that I didn't, there's so much I didn't even talk about in the book, right? Um, because you just, in the end, <laughs> you can't put it all in. So uh, yeah, and then I think also, you know, when your energy is limited, it becomes um, easier to say no and to be clear about what it is that the work that really matters in your one small life. Well, we will all look forward to what comes next. Um, I wanna wrap us up by first thanking you for this incredibly important contribution that this book makes, not just to the understanding of chronic illness, but also just to the real daily lives of people who are navigating illness. Um, and thank you for your conversation today amidst co you know, the aftermath of COVID in your own life. Um, you know. Perhaps ironically, in light of our conversation, I, it, this has felt actually very coherent and redemptive to me, which <laughs> maybe only reasserts why your perspective is so vitally necessary. Um, so thank you, Megan. Thank you, Jonathan. You're just really the ideal interlocutor and I'm 
wishing we can do this again, in fact. And I want to thank again Radcliffe and Sue and um, Becky and, and those who were here before, Judith Vishniak and Sharon Lynn Bromberg. I mean, just this book would truly not exist without Radcliffe. So thank you to Radcliffe and to all of you who came out on this beautiful day on the East Coast, at least. <laughs> yeah. Yes. yes. So thank you for everyone who joined us today. Um, thanks for your wonderful questions. Um, I want to let you know that today's program has been recorded um, and it's going to be posted on the Radcliffe website in about a week. Um, and you can find more information about upcoming Radcliffe virtual programs, including the final book talk program of the summer, which is on August 9th. Um, and also videos of past events um, by going to radcliffe.harvard.edu. Um, thank you again for joining us today. And given everything that we've discussed today, please do take care. <laughs>